Okay, so a very good morning. Um, thank you for coming on board. And of course, uh, today is a very um, special day. We are in pink October, as you can perhaps see by the already uh, pink slides uh, that, that Prof has kindly uh, put up for us. And we're very fortunate this morning to be able to have with us Professor Dr. Noor Aisha uh, Mohamad Taib. She is, um, and please allow me to introduce her. And then before we, we kind of uh, turn over the session to her, like I was saying, a few housekeeping rules before we kind of kick in. First is, if you, if you are just coming into the session, uh, please remember to kind of uh, mute your microphones, uh, stop your videos, and then uh, there will be a, a little pause between the two subsections. And in that pause, I think uh, you can put up your questions in the chat. And uh, don't forget that in order to kind of get your CME points, there'll be two code words. One I will give uh, right uh, in the middle. And um, uh, the second really is something that you can put on uh, right uh, to the end uh, or when, when it comes closer to the end. So um, thank you very much. So we, we will begin uh, this morning's session. So um, we, we've put up, uh, actually it's my fault, Prof asked to not put such a controversial title, I think, uh, why are women still dying? But really that is the truth that we, we need to address. Uh, and, and we are very lucky this morning to be able to have Professor Dr. Noor Aisha Mohamad Taib. Um, uh, Prof is a professor at the Department of Surgery, the Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya. Uh, she's also a consultant breast surgeon, um, originally an, an alumni of the University of Malaya. So um, she, she trained there as well, but she's also done quite a bit of um, uh, work um, and, and kind of attachments overseas with the University of Texas, with Charles Third in Australia, and with the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Uh, I'm sure actually most of you all know uh, Prof in, in various capacities. She speaks quite a bit and she's very, very actively engaged with research, but she's also um, held various other uh, kind of academic and professional positions, including as the chairman of the breast chapter of the College of Surgeons of Malaysia. And currently, Prof is also the head of the University of Malaya Cancer Research Institute, UMCRI. So um, it's, it's all these different hats that she's wearing, but um, I think uh, a topic that remains very close to her heart is still breast cancer. And that's where a lot of her work is uh, up to date. So without further ado, please allow me to kind of uh, turn the session over to Prof Aisha. Uh, who will speak to us uh, about why are women still dying uh, and, and addressing challenges in detection of breast cancer care in Malaysia. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Murali. I think, uh, thanks, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm actually the past chairman of the breast chapter. So um, the current chair is uh, Dato uh, Imi Sairi. So um, thank you for having me. And as you say, this is a very, uh, something very close to my heart, yeah? Okay. Let me see. Ah, okay, all right. So I think the session today, we're going to break it into two parts. So the first part is really trying to understand what's happening in Malaysia and what are the challenges that we have in uh, ensuring that our patients uh, have better outcomes. And then the part two is really uh, more into screening and early detection or what we call early diagnosis and how we can improve help-seeking behavior. So I will be touching a little bit about uh, communication skills for doctors when we are seeing our patients. All right, so we know that, um, you know, very busy slide, but this is our latest National Cancer Registry report that came out. Um, I think this one was just about maybe about a year ago. And uh, this is a report of the years 2012 to 2016, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, so what we find here is that uh, because we now have multiple national cancer registry reported over the years, we know that the incidence is increasing and uh, the risk between the different races is still among the Chinese is the commonest, one in 22, among the Indians, one in 23, and among the Malays, one in 30. So the overall lifetime risk for uh, someone in Malaysia is one in 27, okay? And we know that the age groups uh, that we should look out for, the age peaks at 60 to 64 years, but even at the beginning, at the age of 25, the, there is a um, diagnosis of breast cancer, okay? All right, 
So what is the commonest cancer in Malaysia? So usually when, when we put up these slides, usually it comes out as the commonest cancer among women, okay? So as usual, lah, you know, women and men, sometimes it's political, lah, you know? You, you, uh, sometimes when it's a woman's issue, it may not be taken seriously. So I'd like to put up this slide because really breast cancer is the most common cancer uh, and following... Uh, after that would be colorectal cancer, also a very common cancer among women. And then lung cancer, the third cancer. And the fourth is lymphoma. Okay, so the trends, I think even from the previous report, 2007 to 2011, compared to 2012, 2016, there is a slight increase in the percentage of people with breast cancer. Okay, so this is the distribution between the different uh, genders. So you can see for female, breast is first, colorectal, and then the third one is cervical cancer. For male, is colorectal, lung, and then prostate. Okay, so how do we differ in terms of incidence? It means how common uh, or how high risk or what is the risk of our population compared to people from different parts of the region? So you can see compared to the Singapore, Chinese, Malay and Indians, our incidence is much lower. Okay, but we can also see from the trends is, is going to increase in the future. All right, so I think this is the slide that I think for most of us, when we saw this first report that came out in 2018, you can compare the five-year relative survival, comparing Malaysia, Japan, Okay, US and even our neighbor Singapore, we are not doing very well. So the five-year relative survival rates in Malaysia is only about 66.8%. And you compare that to our neighbor, it's 80.3%, right? So that's a marked difference. It's about almost like a 15% difference in survival rates. All right, so how, why do you think, I mean, I think most of us feel this is the reason um, because stage is an important prognostic factor for breast cancer. But of course, there could be other reasons that we will explore later. So you can see uh, over the two uh, National Cancer Registry reports, unfortunately, the stage 3 and 4 cancers have increased from 43.2% to about 47.9%. So that's a, quite a jump. Uh, and uh, it looks like we're not doing so well in the setting of making our women come earlier. All right, so just to share with you, this is a publication uh, many years ago. So this is a very early publication in one hospital, okay? So it shows that the survival rates obviously is related to the stage of cancer. So you can see that um, there's 100% if they're diagnosed in this uh, like precancerous lesion for, uh, in five years, and then it steadily comes down. But you can see that stage one and two, the survival rates are extremely good. For stage one, 98% five year survival. And then for stage two, which is the commonly found cancer, uh, which is symptomatic, you know, patients who are symptomatic, most of them could be in stage two. And that survival rate is very good. Uh, the five year survival rate is about 88%. And then it comes down steadily. For stage three, it's about 52%. And in our hospital, unfortunately, for stage four, it's only about 16%. But you can see from the... Um, sorry, yeah. let's see why it's not moving. Okay. All right. So if you look at the National Cancer Registry report, <clears throat> you can see that um, for stage four cancers, it's actually higher, you know, the five-year survival rates. Of course, it's more recent data, but um, this... National Cancer Registry is the report of the whole country. So we do know that uh, access to treatment is in the private sector um, or even maybe in some Ministry of Health hospitals where some drugs that are very important for, in, in fact, it's life-saving drugs like Herceptin and so on, is more uh, available in these settings rather than in the university settings. Yeah. Uh, it's all about access to the treatments. So if you look at this slide, this is a slide looking at the different ethnic groups, uh, Indian, Chinese, Malay, different colors. As you can see, for female breast cancer, the Chinese women survive much better compared to the Indian and the Malay patients. So we also saw this in our hospital and we've adjusted it to treatments, to stage, and we still found that the ethnic group is an independent prognostic factor. So, so we're trying to figure out why is that so. So there could be other, you know, it could be a surrogate marker of lifestyle, uh, body mass index, and so on and so forth. So we're still looking for these answers. Uh, 
through our cohort study in UMMC. So this is a problem in Malaysia. We have a late presentation. Okay, if you look at the distribution among all the different publications uh, that that's been reported, you can see in the East Coast, it can be as high as about 80%, stage three and four. In Sarawak, it could be as high as 60%, right? In KL, depending on the locality, which hospital is between 20 to 50%. So it is a massive problem in our country. So, I mean, to think about, uh, it's not just us, okay? A lot of the middle income countries um, where access to not just treatments, access to diagnosis and all that is an issue. Um, WHO has come up with this report um, much early, you know, it's actually in 2017, I think, yeah. And the priorities that WHO put into um, cancer control for middle income and lower income countries, which do not have the, um, I think, uh, access to screening facilities, the first priority is actually health literacy. We have to improve health literacy among the public as well as the healthcare professionals. And we need to strengthen the health system itself for diagnostic services. Then only you, the third priority is screening because uh, investing in screening is a very high um, capital cost and also human resource cost. Um, when you can diagnose someone who's symptomatic and you strengthen that uh, aspect of it, you can actually get a lot of uh, benefits. So let me share with you from this report. They actually showed what happened in the US. So you can look over the years from the 50s right up to 2000. The earlier part of the uh, care was there was no cancer screening in the, in the US. Okay, You can see the mortality incident ratio steeply reduced even during this period of time when there's no mammogram screening. Okay, so the reason is there's more awareness, detection is mainly for symptomatic women at an earlier stage, and that reduction is quite marked. Okay, and then you look at after the introduction of mammographic screening, there's still reduced reduction in the uh, mortality incidence ratio, uh, but don't forget there's also better at juvenile treatments at that time. So maybe for our country where our survival rates is very low, it's about 66%. And maybe investing in screening first may not be the, the right thing to do. It could be really looking at strengthening the health systems for diagnostic services. So what do we mean when we say early diagnosis? So I think Malaysia, we like to use the word early detection. I think there's no harm. I think it's a very uh, good term. But what uh, early diagnosis separates uh, the, 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 the term is that when the woman is asymptomatic, before she develops any symptoms, this part is called screening. I mean, we all know for breast cancer, okay, the evidence-based uh, screening tool is a mammographic screening, okay. There's some uh, suggestion of clinical breast examination, like in India, there have been studies to show the efficacy of clinical breast examination in screening, okay. When the symptoms uh, improve, uh, begin, that's when we call it early diagnosis. So early detection can be overall, but early diagnosis is specifically looking for people with symptoms. Okay, so why is it that our patients or our women don't come early for their uh, presentation? So a few years, I mean, many years ago, I did a doctorate on this, and uh, basically it was un uh, trying to understand the phenomenon from 19 women diagnosed with very advanced cancer. So from those uh, qualitative interviews, there were, I came up with two models. So one is the breast cancer delay model. So this breast cancer delay model show at which points do people actually delay, uh, could be delay in presentation, could be delay in uh, getting a diagnosis and also getting delays in the treatment decisions. Okay, so treatment decision delay is something that we know that, um, you know, affects a lot of our patients. But you can see even at the point of, uh, noticing bodily symptom. Once they feel a breast lump, they can even delay at that point. Okay, so I think for, <clears throat> for a lot of the primary care doctors, <clears throat> it's important to know that even when you're seeing someone, sorry, I'm going to take a drink. <clears throat> even if you diagnose someone at, um, in your clinic, that means the patient has a lump, at that point, she's, she may actually delay going further. So this is very important. And we will cover this part in the part two of the talk later. Okay. All right. So at each point of the delays, 
Okay, and that those delays, again, could be due to the health systems or it could be due to the patients themselves. Okay, so for example, if you disclosure delay, it could be patient because they're not telling anyone. So we have women coming to hospital after months of having a symptom or even years after having a symptom and then coming with a bleeding breast lump, for example. So that's disclosure delay. And a lot of it is in the patient domain. <clears throat> But later on, you can see, for example, uh, diagnostic delays. We have studies to show that the multiple visits to the clinic because diagnosis was not resolved quickly from multiple biopsies and all that, it can cause a diagnostic delay. So every point of these delays can be, it could be in the public health domain, uh, could be in the clinical domain or in the hospital and the clinic setting. Okay, And um, these models try to separate and so that when you do interventions, you can plan where would you intervene? Where are the points you would intervene? Okay. So at each point, there is what we call the explanatory model. So why do people delay at those points? Uh, so we, I found that there were four main reasons why they delay. It's mainly on the breast health literacy. So disease and its outcome. Some people don't know, you know, cancer can spread. So that's important that they know. Treatment and its outcomes. Okay, we have a very strong alternative uh, medicine uh, in Malaysia. So that's something that we need to educate our patients to. Okay, and of course, they are worried about chemo and so forth. So sometimes they don't know enough about this. And of course, the coping aspects, the resources like coping, the psychosocial support, the financial support, the social support, all this affect the delays. And of course, how they make decisions. Uh, what role they play. Sometimes parents actually make the decisions for the for the patient or the husbands make decisions for the patient. Okay, or sometimes even self, you know, women themselves do not want to have the treatments. And we know very well from the action study, I think this is uh, Nirmala, is our country PI, was published back in 2012. A lot of financial catastrophe, so I won't go into too much details. Okay, and then we have... Um, some information about health system delays in our uh, hospitals in Malaysia. So one of our PhD students, Marstura, she studied uh, delays in about six public hospitals. And she found that really in uh, a lot of the, I mean, this is a, a overall view, the presentation of breast cancer could be between seven days to 10 years. Okay, we know some women present, I mean, they're very lucky because these cancers are very slow growing. So they can actually come after 10 years with an ulcer and they have no other problems, okay? But of course, these are very slow growing type of tumors. We don't know if it's a very, very aggressive type, like the triple negative breast cancer, they usually come very early because the symptoms progresses very quickly, okay? Then we have the delays in diagnostic interval. All right, so it can be between four days to nine months. Okay, so nine months could be because, you know, scheduling delays for their mammograms and so forth. Okay, how about treatment? Treatment can be delayed up to about seven months. Okay, all right. So what she found was people who had delays beyond three months, that means they present a, a symptom of more than three months, is about 35%. So most women would come when the symptoms is less than three months. Okay. Diagnosis delay, still about 40% of the patients were diagnosed beyond a month after they were they first presented to clinic. And treatment can be about 35.3% actually had delays in their treatment beyond a month. Okay, so I don't think I will go into much details about why, uh, but we see that in certain parts of the country, presentation delay is very marked. So for example, in Kelantan, the, the, the risk of presenting with delays is four times more than people in Selangor and KL, okay? All right, and of course, complementary alternative medicine is also a reason why people present late to the hospital. And this is diagnostic delays uh, where more than two biopsies. So sometimes the problem with our health system is that breast clinics are run by the most junior surgical surgeon, you know, when they first pass out, they will run breast clinic, okay? This is the problem we have sometimes. Um, so sometimes what happens is uh, even maybe the patients don't even see a specialist. So when the biopsy is done, multiple biopsies can be repeated because they cannot come to a resolution. That means insufficient samples, etc. So this is also a problem that we face in our public hospitals. Okay. All right. 
And of course, complementary alternative medicine also play a role in diagnostic delay. So this could really be patient delaying having um, biopsies. Okay, they are so scared of biopsies. So we'll talk about it later. Okay, right. How about treatment delays? So we found that even in some parts of the country, there are delays. So, okay, so I'm not going to go into too much details with this. All right, how about if we the patients don't have treatment? So in our hospital, we found that the rates of uh, survival it reduces when people abscond. Okay, and uh, we know the rates of non-adherence is, uh, I mean, I've already mentioned it just now. So we know that it's probably about like even tamoxifen, uh, after one year, you better check what your patient, whether they're on it, because 35% of them may actually have stopped it. Okay. All right. So we will have the, um, this is the overall view of the six hospitals. So you can see most patients adhere to their surgery. Okay. Uh, about 86% of them. Okay. Won't go into too many details with this. All right. So we also had a study uh, on our cohort of patients in UMMC done by one of our medic master surgery candidates. So he found that um, the duration of symptoms for surgery adherence, like people who do not adhere were high, uh, had likelihood of presenting it. So this could be behavioral. Okay. All right. And for radiotherapy, we found that financial reimbursement is important. So that's why now we're trying to do some sort of financial counseling at the beginning of diagnosis rather than tell them step by step how much things will cost. You have to tell them upfront roughly how much things will cost so they can plan. Okay, right. Let me go on. All right, so in, in summary, we, we have quite a low cancer survival compared to the region. There's a lot of late stage presentation. There could be health system delays. It could be patient delays. And there is most likely inequitable access to the diagnosis and treatments across the country. All right. Okay. So I think there has been a lot of uh, mood around the world about improving uh, or delivering high quality cancer care. All right. And the issues that they usually address is the knowledge aspects and coordinating the care and providing psychosocial support and ensuring that the finances as so that's how, you know, um, I think it's quite complex, but we should try to see what is possible. Because I think Malaysia, our treatments are quite good. It's just a matter of the coordination and the access to it. All right. So this is uh, from the American uh, IOM uh, report, how they think you can improve care by providing patient-centered care. So if you look at patient-centered care, you need to improve the way we communicate with patients. So I think even in my study of that 19 women, some women delayed because they, uh, when they were told about their disease, they did not go to the next steps because they felt uh, they, didn't, they, they didn't have a good experience when they spoke to the doctors. Okay, right. Okay, so we know in Malaysia, we do have quite a few uh, projects and I think Cancer Research Malaysia and Hospital uh, Ampuan Rahima in Klang has proven that actually by doing a proper navigation care within the hospitals, that means you improve um, the, you know, the, the, the navigation of patients going through their steps of making a diagnosis actually can improve the outcome in terms of reduce the stage and so forth. So you can look at uh, these are the factors associated with the late stage presentation. They found that there is an emotional barrier among the patients that is an independent factor for late stage presentation. People who prefer to speak in languages other than English. So this is a major problem in Malaysia. I think the commonest uh, ethnic group is really the Chinese patients. But most of the public hospitals, I think there are not many Chinese personnel. Okay, So I know of a patient of mine who actually volunteers to bring her friends or her anybody who cannot speak Malay or English, who can only speak Chinese, she's a Chinese patient herself, she brings the patient to HKL to help the woman communicate. I think this is something we need to look at because there is a disparity in the communication. So I think even in the hospital setting, we have to provide, uh, you know, like uh, maybe uh, Mandarin speaking nurses or translators, you know, because this will improve care. Right, and you can see referral, uh, interdepartmental referral also is a significant factor for late 
stage presentation. So it's like if you're working in the same hospital, if you work in Ruka, for example, Rauta Utama, if you didn't know you can just call up the breast clinic and refer, you may actually do more harm by actually trying to organize things like mammogram. Because mammogram in public hospitals is a nightmare. You, your earliest date is one year's time. But if you refer them to a breast clinic where there is systems in place where you can get urgent lists uh, to do these mammograms. So the, the interdepartmental uh, referral is an important thing that we should think about also. All right. So if you look at their data from the KPIs or key performance indicator for their patient navigation, you can see that their mammographic uh, timeliness uh, from 74 receiving it less than a week to 96.4%. I think this is fantastic, okay? And then communication of news less than 40 days from 58%, it came up to 80%. So I really feel they are doing a great job. I think Datuk Yusof and uh, CRM, they are moving, uh, they are doing this in another six hospitals around the country. I think that's fantastic, okay? The other thing is the health literacy aspects. So I think, you know, there's not much information for Malaysian patients out there. So I'm just going to share with you this page. It's on YouTube. It's free. We have uh, videos here on clinical breast examination. We have the information about treatments. We have it in Malay, English, and Mandarin. Okay. So we've just published this recently, but we have been on the YouTube for five years. So I think please use these resources if you think it is useful for, for your patients. Okay. And the other thing, I think we are about to sign our MOU for the Malaysia's Greater Petaling City, where we want to look at not just um, strengthening the health systems, but we want to treat cancer as a real, is a problem, a city problem. That means you may get more resources from um, social welfare department, you know, and how to coordinate care between the different um, health sectors like the primary care, secondary care, tertiary care, and so forth, right? So we are looking forward to this two-year program that will start soon, I think, by end of this year. So this, we are one of the cities in the, in the world to be uh, fortunate enough to have won this uh, City Cancer Challenge um, uh, bit, we, we won it in 2019, but because of COVID and all this is a bit delayed, but the MOU is currently being um, discussed and hopefully we will get it done by end of this year, right? So the reason and the vision for this city focused collection, collective action is to, to improve the quality of cancer care, right? And how to deliver it, right? And the mission is also to create a global community of cities and partners working together to design, plan, and implement localized cancer solutions to save lives, okay? So the other program that we're doing, uh, I think there's so many stakeholders in this program, but we're trying to understand the urban community because uh, if you look at this, uh, breast cancer death rates are quite high really uh, in, not high, lah, not too bad in our hospital when we look at our private versus public. Okay, we got into trouble a bit because we published this, nobody realized. And then suddenly in 2018, um, this came, became a headline. But the reason why people are not uh, surviving better, that means in PPUM, our survival rate is about 72% in five years. But in the private uh, UMSC, is about 87%. So what we found was the stage at diagnosis was the main reason why there was this difference. Okay, so we do know that the urban community and most, I think Malaysia will be quite urbanized, like in another 10 years, probably like we'll reach 80% urbanization or something like that. Okay, like maybe not that high, okay. But um, it would, uh, we need to look into the urban community because we need to understand <clears throat> what are the cultural issues, what are the communication strategies that we can use to improve um, the, 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 the presentation, early presentation of the patient to the hospitals. Okay, so this is a program that we will embark on uh, and we will be involving the GPs actually around Taman Medan. So we just had a workshop to, in, to try to um, improve healthcare provider literacy on screening and early diagnosis of the top four cancers uh, in Malaysia, which is breast, colorectal, lung, and cervical cancer, okay? Right, okay, so I'm actually going, or I've actually finished my first part. So um, I think I made good time, right, Murali? 
So um, we are now at 11.35, right? So I think why don't we have some questions first um, and then maybe we can clarify some issues and maybe, you know, is there any questions that we can, we can help you with? Hi, uh, Prof. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, yeah, you're, you're really on time. Uh, yes. Where is this? There, there is, I think, one question which okay. you might uh, be addressing later, but I'll just put it up now itself. It's okay. um, the, what is the latest prognosis with TNBC? Oh, TNBC. Is, okay. Yeah. Right. So I, you may be covering this later, Prof. So I, I, I'm just going to ask it and then we, we'll just keep it up. Uh, what is the latest prognosis with TNBC? Is new adjuvant therapy better for stage two and adjuvant better for stage three or stage four? Okay, all right. I think, I mean, unfortunately, our, uh, the, I mean, of course, I think, uh, I think maybe we have a lot of survivors, I think, in the groups uh, who are here today. They want to know these things, but I'm not really covering treatments today. I'm really talking about the diagnostic, you know, how we can get people to come earlier. But let me, right. let me just answer some of these questions. So I think the first thing we, you must understand, the approach to cancer treatments now is very biology-based. It's all biomarker-based. The, the, the decision-making for what treatments the patient need is <clears throat> the biomarkers. That means all breast cancers, we know if you do a DNA test on cancers, you can find five subtypes, okay? Five types or subtypes of breast cancer. But when we, when we do on the clinical grounds, that means when we treat patients, we look at the histopathology report. That means when the diagnosis is made, um, the subtype of the cancer is, 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 is reported. That is the morphology of the cancer. Okay? But the biomarker of the cancer is important because the next treatments depend on it. So the biomarkers we are talking about is ER, PR, and HER2. Okay, so the ERPR, if it's positive, we call it hormone sensitive tumors, and HER2 is HER2 overexpressed tumors. But if all is negative, ER negative, PR negative, HER2 negative, then we call this the triple negative breast cancer. Okay, so the question was asking about the latest prognosis for triple negative breast cancer. Okay. So I, I don't have the slides here, but I think many years ago, we looked at our hospital, I think Nemala did, uh, I think it was published. Um, and what we saw was, unfortunately at that point in time where access to Herceptin was so poor, our HER2 actually did worse than the triple negative breast cancers. Okay. Um, but now because there are targeted therapies for HER2, the survival rates for her two breast cancer has improved so much compared to triple negative. So triple negative breast cancer, unfortunately, still denotes a poor prognosis. But even then, um, doesn't mean that when somebody is diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer and it's curable, that means stage one to three, they are not curable, okay? If the patient survives beyond seven years, most likely this patient is going to survive and will survive the cancer, okay? Nowadays, the strategies to treatment includes neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Neoadjuvant chemo just means you give the chemo before we operate. Okay, so remember just now I told you all the treatments depend on biomarkers. The second thing that we decide on is actually the stage of the cancer. So there are two things that help us decide what to do first. Breast cancer treatment is multimodality, so you have surgery, chemo, radiotherapy, hormonal therapy, HER2 targeted therapy, and maybe in the future there's immunotherapy, so maybe there's six, and then there's other targeted therapies as well, okay? Maybe there's seven different types of treatments available, right? But which one should we do first? So when we look at the uh, biomarker, people with HER2 overexpression and triple negative breast cancer will benefit from new adjuvant treatments if they are curable cancers. That means stage one to three. Once the patient is stage four, then the treatments become more like systemic therapies rather than surgery. So there's a latest abstract uh, in ESCO uh, published this year uh, that shows that there's no benefit of actually doing surgery for stage four cancer. Okay, so that you must know. 
okay but if you have curable cancer and the cancer is triple negative or her2 overexpressed they will benefit from new adjuvant treatments because the strategy of treatments have slightly changed because you know when you give new adjuvant chemo you have the opportunity of seeing whether the chemotherapy or the target therapy works then when we operate on the patient there may be residual tumor left or the tumor is all wiped out by the treatments and when the tumor is all wiped out by the treatments we call this complete pathological response so this information is important because the studies have shown for triple negative breast cancer if the patient still has residual disease then the patient will benefit from having extended treatments extended treatments means after you know you do new adjuvant that means you already have your six cycle of chemo right you have surgery then if there's residual disease you will need to have further chemotherapy which is usually the oral chemotherapy or capcitabine so it's a tablet chemotherapy for about i think six cycles right for her2 overexpression also the same thing there are so many her2 drugs that is targeted to the um, <clears throat> to the her2 uh, cancer so these cancers can respond better if you use two types of her2 before you operate okay which is the pertuzumab and her trastuzumab right okay but then it's so expensive not accessible again okay so there are issues about that then if the patient still has residual disease after we operate okay then the patient will go on another her2 drug called tdm1 so because of these changes in the treatment strategies these two type of cancers maybe is better to do a uh, new adjuvant treatments first all right okay So for the surgeon the other thing we like to do when we do new adjuvant treatment is for someone who may be suitable for breast conserving surgery that means a lumpectomy uh when up front the patient may need a mastectomy but the lesion is only one but it's too big to have good cosmetic results then we use new adjuvant treatments to shrink the tumor so that we can offer lumpectomy as the definitive surgery Okay so that's the other thing why we do new adjuvant treatment. So I hope that answers your question in a nutshell. Um yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll do um prof so next a couple more questions shall we take them first prof and then go on to the second yeah. part. Okay. Okay. So uh, there's a question from I think uh, Dr. Shivali. Um is breast examination a challenge in terms of privacy issues in the Malaysian setting? Okay I think I think whatever we say and you know about breast con, uh, examination you'll be surprised I've been in breast clinic I remember in the days where we had a lot of these folders coming to us where is written there you know ladies only so I remember when I was a medical officer many many years ago I was the last one to leave lah because I had to do all this women punya examination right but I find that um Although there is a need for this that means they want a lady doctor to examine their breast but I think majority of the women are happy to have a proper high quality clinical breast examination by a professional doctor okay so most people probably will be okay but for some women they do prefer lady doctors and I I have a, a policy uh, in my clinic if the patient requests that we try to deliver it lah because after all we have female doctors right um yeah so i think in malaysia setting there is still this uh, issue uh, maybe in if you go to the northern states maybe the issues are a little bit more obvious compared to somewhere in kl so i i would say i'm i'm very happy that there are still many female gps you know in our country <clears throat> that means patients do have access to women doctors if they prefer it okay but i would say most women probably does not care because they want good quality care you know so but we have to be sensitive to these things i hope that answers the question okay will do and i think <laughs> just to kind of add on to that i think some other solutions that uh people in primary care can consider especially if you're working in an individual setting is uh, similar to what uh, a lot of people are doing with um, gynecological issues in the sense that you have a visiting female doctor come in every maybe couple of days once 
and then you kind of kumpulkan your patients and then let them be examined. And of course, uh, always to remember that if it's a male physician doing the breast examination, always kind of hand of a chaperon uh, for medical legal purposes. Uh, yeah. Especially, I think we're getting uh, some feedback from colleagues doing the PECA B40. Uh, in the health uh, screening component, you have to do a clinical breast examination. So sometimes it's very odd um, that women suddenly get faced with the idea that, oh, um, you just take my blood, lah. why are you doing a breast examination? So I think that, that needs to be kind of um, looked at uh, a little bit as well. There's another question Prof, from um, an, another doctor. He asks whether is a yearly mammogram helpful in early diagnosis? And then there's, there's a kind of two-parter. Uh, uh, he also asks, uh, is our frequent mammograms itself um, capable of increasing the risk of breast cancer? Should we then substitute and do ultrasound, uh, ultrasound breast instead as a screening tool since, since there's uh, no radiation risk? Okay, I think this one will be covered in the part two. So maybe we can try and clarify it further during the presentation. Okay? Right, right. Okay, and then we we still got one more question, uh, and and that is is uh, CA one five three useful in uh, general screening? Okay, I will also uh, cover that. I will cover that okay. in the next section. That will be okay. I, I will address that uh, specifically. Okay. Okay, lovely, uh, problem. So uh, I, I'm just gonna get uh, get uh, what is this? Um, let you go on onto the second part, and please okay. allow me to put out the first code word, uh, and the first code word really is diagnosis. Uh, so it's as simple as that. Uh, so for when you when you put up your CME uh, form subsequently later, as you know, there's two code words you have to put in. The first code word now is diagnosis. Uh, so without further ado, please allow me to turn this back to Prof, and then uh, let's listen to the second part of this discussion. Thank you. Okay. All right. So the part two we're going to cover about screening, about early diagnosis, and communication. Okay, so I think for, for healthcare providers, I think I would strongly um, uh, encourage you to look for the clinical practice guidelines on the management of breast cancer. So this is in the third edition. So the last one was in 2010. So this is a very long awaited update. So um, you can just Google it. Uh, you can find this uh, on the Ministry of Health websites. Okay, right. So, you know, when we, if you remember what was presented earlier, what was the strategy for most middle-income countries? I think when you look at the public health perspective, it probably will, will be very good if you focus on people with symptoms. All right? All right. So, you know, symptoms of breast cancer patients, um, I think, I mean, you probably are all general practitioners, primary care physicians, so I don't really have to go into too much details about the symptoms, but I may want to draw attention that the most common symptom is a painless breast lump. So a painless breast lump um, could be, as you know, the National Cancer Registry showed that even women 25 and above, there are reports of breast cancer. So you cannot really determine clinically whether this breast lump is cancerous or not cancerous. So clinical breast examination is a very uh, non-sensitive and specific tool to detect breast cancer. It only becomes very sensitive and specific when you already develop ulcers, faux d'orange, um, and then you know uh, nipple retraction. Uh, these are very, very obvious symptoms. But when the patient comes with a breast lump, most of them will come with a painless breast lump. They can have painful breast lumps also, right? What, they, what you need to do is to ensure that you work them up. That's the most important thing. Clinical breast examination alone is not enough, okay? So I've actually put up the relation CPG referral guideline. So as you can see there, there's no retrievable evidence on referral criteria of patients with signs and symptoms of breast, to breast clinic. So there's no, no studies or anything like that to prove anything. But the consensus was made for, by the CPG development group to say that if you have women uh, beyond age 35 and above with signs and symptoms, and you have all the signs and symptoms there, or they are high risk group. Okay, who is high risk? We will also talk about it later. Uh, and they have signs and symptoms. All right. 
basically anybody with sinus symptom, you should refer, especially if they're above 35, right? Okay, so what are the general signs symptoms? Palpable mass, breast pain, which is not very common, nipple discharge. Okay, nipple discharge, I think for most women, this is the one, the worried well will be very worried when one day they keep on uh, expressing and they find nipple discharge. So what is suspicious? Suspicious is when it's a single dark discharge. That single dark discharge, it comes out spontaneously. It could be serious. It could be bloody. But if it's only coming from one or two ducts, these are the ones that is considered suspicious and need to be referred. So the sign of malignancy here, unfortunately, these are all late signs, you know. Heart fixed mass, asymmetric thickening, skin changes. Okay, all these are very late signs. So I would say, okay, don't forget axillary mass is also something. Eh? Sometimes they don't have any breast lump, but they have axillary masses. This, okay, you see they even have that image detected suspicious lesion. This is when, I think most GPs do use mammographic services. They do uh, send their patients for screening. Um, if the patient has a suspicious lesion, you need to refer, okay? Right? So what they su uh, suggest is that it has to be referred within two weeks of the, uh, uh, when you found something abnormal on clinical breast examination. All right, then how about women without symptoms? This is your day-to-day, -day. someone comes with another problem, you may want to bring up um, to educate them about, uh, about breast cancer screening. All right, so I put up this whole list of non-modifiable and modifiable factors. Actually, you can get this from the CPG quite easily. All right, I've also put this up, risk models, okay. You might wonder if you all remember when Angelina Jolie talked about her risk-reducing mastectomy many years ago and what she said that she had a 89 point something percent risk, right? So you wonder how come she got such a personalized risk um, uh, value, right? So there are models available, uh, but unfortunately these models have been calibrated to the European women, you know? There are not many Asians in that model. Hence, for Malaysia, we cannot really use these models, unfortunately, at the moment. Okay, But what they, when you hear people talk about average risk, moderate risk, high risk, these are all because these models can actually produce an individualized risk model. So I think like Angelina Jolie, it could probably have been the Bodicea or even the Tyra Cusick, um, model that came up with this number so anything beyond 30 percent lifetime risk okay but no known genetic variant that means the patient uh, it, it when you plug in the information into these models which looks at family history numbers of people in the family past history of any uh, abnormal uh, biopsies right all those things will come up with a score so anything beyond 30 percent is considered high risk Moderate risk is between 17 to 30. Average risk is less than 17%. Okay. So remember, what is our risk, population risk in Malaysia? It's about 1 in 30. So 1 in 30 is how much? So it's only about, probably about 6% or something like that, right? So our risk is actually, the average risk for our population is actually very low. It's about 6%. Because in the UK, in the US, their risk is like 1 in 8, 1 in 10. Ours is 1 in about 30. So our, our issue is actually lower than what we have in the in the West. So that's why sometimes when we think about it, is it really uh, justifiable that we do screening for the population? Or we should be targeting our screening to people who have risk factors. Okay, so now I'm going back to the risk factors. So you see, unfortunately, we don't have that model where we can plug in the information to come up with a score. But what we have are information about risk factors. So if you find your patients have any of these risk factors, you may consider referring them on for, uh, or not even referring, even managing yourself uh, by asking them to go for opportunistic screening. That means um, the, the government or not government, like the country doesn't offer screening for all women in the country. 
but you as a doctor or the patient who is knowledgeable may actually uh, use this uh, opportunistic screening tool to detect cancer at an earlier stage. Okay, so what are the risk factors? So age, advancing age is a risk factor. Gender, female more common than male. Male has a 1% rate, uh, rate of breast cancer. Okay. Family history of breast cancer at a young age. Young age means less than 50. So if the patient has a family history, how do you know it's considered something significant? The family history usually is uh, calculated separately. Mom side and dad side is calculated separately. And yes, the, the paternal line can also transmit the gene. The maternal line can also uh, transmit the gene. So it's not just mother's side, it's both sides of the family, mother and father, right? For the, um, uh, how do we look at the risk? We look at the numbers of people in that one line, mother's side or father's side. It doesn't add on, okay? So if you have like three members in the family, first or second degree relatives, breast cancer, this is high risk, already considered high risk, okay? If you have a, a, a single first degree relative, that means mother or sister, um, who had breast cancer less than the age of 50 years old, this we consider as moderate risk, okay? But if they are more than 50 years old, even if it is the first degree relative, usually it's a discussion with the family, with the patient. Because you can either choose to use the average risk population screening, that means every two years once, or because it's a first degree relative, they prefer to have yearly screening. So I don't think we should um, uh, deny women of yearly mammogram screening if they have first degree relatives with breast cancer. Okay. Of course, there are other history, the family history that might point towards certain gene carriers, right? So for example, BRCA is breast and ovarian cancer, right? PELB2, so breast and ovarian, a breast, mainly breast cancer. ATM check could be like a different, a lot of different types of cancer also, right? Okay, then there are other risk factors like young age, age at menarche, less than 12, late menopause, more 50 and above, right? Or history of any of these biopsies before, atypical ductal hyperplasia, lobular in situ cancers, previous breast cancer, DCIS, these are all important risk factors that we have to uh, ask our patients. Okay, the last one I need you to know about is the breast density. So breast density is measured using the mammogram. So a very good radiologist would report the breast density. So I will tell you a little bit more about what this is. But when the woman's breast is dense, her risk of having cancer is four times more than a woman with non-dense cancer, a uh, non-dense breast. Okay, I will I will show you what it is later. Okay, right. How about modifiable risk factors? Naliparity is not not being married. It's more about not having children. Okay, would increase risk. Lack of breastfeeding increases risk. Older age at first life birth also increases risk. Okay, but not that much. At most, it is probably one and a half times more, or actually much less than that, less than one point two relative risk of actually developing uh, cancers. Okay, OCP may actually increase slightly increase the risk. Okay. Lifestyle, which I think for GP is very important. You can do a lot of preventive care. Overweight uh, and obese throughout their adulthood is a risk factor. Physical activity, low physical activity is a risk factor. So the WHO has recommended 150 minutes per week of brisk walking or 75 minutes a week of running. Okay, So you can actually advise your patients that. Green tea is protective. More than three cups, three cups and above reduces risk. Coffee will be controversial because the statistics is not significant, but yes, it may actually reduce risk. Okay, Soy reduces risk. Alcohol increases risk. Okay, Radiation exposure. If you have a cancer, childhood cancer survivors, so they may have had non-Hodgkin lymphoma and they have radiotherapy to the chest or the paraiotic nodes and all that, they are at increased risk of breast cancer. So they need to be followed up. Uh, and sometimes we even do yearly mammograms for these people, okay? But we need to discuss this. Uh, best you refer to a breast clinic for these patients, okay? Radiotherapy for breast cancer, unfortunately, does increase 
slightly the risk of contralateral breast cancer. Okay, but the, the benefits of radio in the survival of the cancer patient is we outweighs the risk of contralateral breast cancer. Okay. All right, let me try to move on. All right, so the mammogram, uh, how I think I don't really have to tell you about mammograms uh, and also we're not going to go into the details, but a lot of the patients are afraid of mammogram. So one of the things that we should inform them is that all mammograms are handled by female radiographers. I think it's a law in Malaysia that all radiography uh, handlers, that means people who help women compress the breast, there's a lot of manipulation of the breast to actually compress it properly, is done only by female radiographers. Okay, so that's important for us to inform the patients, right? Okay, and then this is what the CPG suggests we should be doing screening mammogram biennially, so every two years in women aged 50 to 74 years in the general population. So these are people with average risk. For women of high risk of breast cancer, where no genetic variant has been identified, screening mammogram may be considered from 30 to 39 years of age. Okay, all right. Perform annually from 40 to 59 and biennially from 60 onwards. Okay, so these are people who have not been tested for any genes, but they fulfill criteria of high risk. That means they got like three members in the family with breast cancer, or if they have two, one must be less than 50, right? Or they may have things like breast ovarian cancer in the same person. I mean, sorry, breast or ovarian cancer in the family or bilateral breast cancers, right? This would put the patient at a higher risk. So we would consider doing yearly mammogram, even from the age of 30. Less than 30, we cannot do mammograms, okay? But this is in special situations, all right? For carriers of pathogenic or lightly pathogenic variants, BRCA1, BRCA2, PALB2, annual MRI should be offered from 30 to 49, annual mammography 40 to 69, Biennial mammography from 70 and above. So there are specific uh, recommendations in the CPG. So please have a look at the CPG and um, so that it can guide your practice. All right. The other things that was recommended that digital breast tomosynthesis may be considered in screening and diagnosis of breast cancer based on its availability. We know that mammography is made you know, differently. So that means you have the old analog uh, mammogram, which I hope has been phased out because it doesn't really help and it misses a lot of cancers, right? And then we have the second, the first generation of digital mammograms, which is also not bad, right? But still, uh, the best one now is the 3D memo or the TOMO synthesis. Is it actually quite widely available nowadays? I think in the government setting, maybe PPUM only, but in the private setting, we have it. National Cancer Society has it. Um, I think a lot of the big hospitals have it now. So yes, so tomosynthesis is almost like a CT of the breast. So what it does, it, you can actually um, look at you know, slices of the breast rather than just a, 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 a static view of the mammogram, a 2D static view of the mammogram. All right, recommendation four, by rats is the preferred reporting method in the management of breast cancer, okay? I mean, unfortunately, they didn't put at screening, but I would say I would recommend you sending to uh, places where the radiologist would report the by rat system. I will go through the by rat system with you in a short while because it will help you make decisions what to do with the patient. Recommendation five, Minimally invasive biopsy technique with core needle is preferred diagnostic technique for both palpable and non-palpable lesions. Okay, so this is important because um, sometimes we still do fine needle aspiration cytology. Do you remember um, I mentioned that during the Q&A session, the treatment depends on the biomarkers. So the biomarkers need to have a core biopsy, not FNAC. Okay. All right, so repeat image guided or consider surgical excision when initial core biopsy are non-diagnostic or discordant with imaging findings. 
this is when I mentioned to you earlier, when we have patients having repeated biopsies, first FNAC is sufficient. Then the doctor tries to do freehand biopsy in clinic. This deletion cannot, you know, because the problem with tumors is it has necrotic areas. So sometimes you biopsy the wrong area, you might get, you don't get cells that are malignant. So again, insufficient. So repeated biopsy is not a good idea because it will delay the diagnosis. Okay. All right. Now let's talk about how to interpret. Because I think for most GPs, you all will probably get reports from the radiologist and you will depend on it to, to see what you should do next. So remember I mentioned to you the breast density reporting. So we have four categories of breast density, A, B, C, D. So the A is no, no density, uh, very, I mean, not, not dense lah, basically, right? So it is almost entirely fatty, okay? But however, it's only in 10% of women, okay? Category B, there's scattered fibroglandular density, okay? So even category B has a risk of uh, breast cancer, yeah, uh, compared to the non-dense breast, right? Category C is when it's heterogeneously dense and category D is when it's extremely dense. So when you see this uh, report, you can understand that you may be missing something. So in some parts of USA, it's legislated that the patient is informed that their breast is dense. Because in America, I think most people, they go for mammogram, they don't have an ultrasound with it, okay? Our radiologists, I think, I think this, this is why it's very important for you to pick centers where you trust your radiologists, okay? Because not, okay, like I shouldn't say this, but not all mammographic reporting um, quality is the same, okay? So you, if you want to provide good service to your patient, find centers that have good radiologists that will report all this, okay? And our radiologists, when they see a breast which is dense and they're not sure, most of them would do a adjunct ultrasound at the same time, but ultrasound also has its limitations, right? So in terms of um, reading the report, you need to understand this and you also need to understand this is for I'm talking about screening. Yeah? When the patient has a lump, anything you do, if your mammogram is normal, you still need to refer because lumps may not be seen on the mammogram at all. And then sometimes, okay, look at the BIRAT score table here. You have six, actually it's seven categories, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, This is for the GP, I think very useful because you can make decisions what to do with your patient. So if they report BIRAT zero, that means the test is incomplete. So if the patient has a lump, goes for a mammogram, that means she goes maybe for, you know, those free mammograms in October, they don't, they don't add on the ultrasound, unfortunately. It's just a mammogram. So the, when the patient has a symptom, goes for this free mammogram, her report comes back as category zero, right? Don't say this is normal, okay? The patient actually needs further uh, imaging. That means usually an ultrasound. Okay, so don't stop when you see zero. All right, you should be happy when it's one and two. So if you are a GP working and looking after women and you get this category one and two, you can happily just put the patient on the next screening schedule. You don't have to repeat. Uh, I mean, sorry, you don't have to make it shorter, shorter intervals. I think just now someone asked about yearly mammograms. So I think I mentioned that the CPG for people with average risk, is too yearly. It's not yearly. Only those who are high risk, you would offer them yearly mammograms. Okay? Right. But what happens when you have three, by rats three? All right? So this uh, just means that you got to do the follow-up interval in a shorter way. You cannot just put, let's say, two yearly memo. The next two years, only you do a memo. That means you may have to do, sometimes when they see some calcification on the mammogram, they're not sure, they want to repeat it in six months. So BIRAX3 is when you got to repeat in six months, right? Okay, whenever you see four, that means a biopsy is needed. So this is when um, it is unfortunate, but I don't think that enough um, radiologist centers that do image-guided biopsies, which is affordable to the patients. 
So like in our hospital, we have so many patients. After October, we, all, we have a huge backlog because of this. And I'm glad that NCSM provides this also to their patients. Um, and a lot of the, I think for, for more access, I think NCSM actually do have quite good programs. Sometimes they actually fund or finance some of the tests for needy patients, right? Okay, but the others, like five, six, we need to biopsy. But when you get a five, you know that it's likely to be a cancer. Six, they've already been biopsied. Okay, right. Let's move on. Okay, so what to expect during a mammogram? I think this is something that I think for doctors, when we are trying to tell women to go for mammogram, their first-hand information comes from their friends and their relatives. So unfortunately, some women do have bad experiences with mammogram. Some of them may have had previous mammograms, you know, uh, where it was not plastic plates. They were metal plates, you know, those days. I had a patient who was crying because she had a lump, but she had a memo like, five years prior to that and she didn't want a memo and uh, she kept coming back because she was so eventually she had a memo and she said hey it wasn't so bad so I guess the modern the modern mammograms are much better compared to what it used to be and I guess the tomo also has less pressure and a lot of patients tell me this so I think that's another thing that you might want to consider when you are talking to patients when they are very scared of pain right some even tell them to take painkiller, Panadol, dual BG, maybe a few hours before your mammogram. Okay, that could be a placebo effect. Okay, but it could also help them to address their fear of pain. Okay, right. Again, I mentioned that all the radiographers are female. So this you need to tell your patient and or else they won't go. Okay. Then, okay, let's look at the doses because people always are afraid of the radiation from a mammogram. Okay, so you look at this. The dose in millisieverts, right? Okay, so you compare this the 2D digital memo. You have the 3D tomosynthesis, average annual natural background uh, uh, in the US. And this is in Colorado. Colorado, I think they have a higher uh, radiation uh, um, readings over there, okay? So you can see actually the dose is actually quite low, right? This is annual. This is one dose, lah, right? But the, the doses are actually similar to five chest x-rays. So the question is, who are the people that we should not offer mammographic uh, screening? For some patients who may have DNA fragility, that means the, the, they have they easily, uh, the cells can easily mutate because they have a predisposition like people with um, ATM, uh, or, or not ATM, sorry, the, um, ataxia, telangiectasia. Okay, these are this type of um, patients or even people with Lee Fromini syndrome. If you all remember Lee Fromini syndrome, the people, the families with sarcomas, breast cancer, adrenal tumors, brain tumors, this type of patient, we will say, okay, we will do MRI for you. Okay, all right. Okay, so... The problem with uh, doing screening is that it's always not your priority, like not the woman's priority. So hopefully we can bring to their attention that it could help them uh, get their diagnosis at an earlier stage. All right. So what do we expect when we do the mammogram? I think it's important to also talk to your patients about what to expect uh, from a mammogram. It's not just a magic test you do. You know, some women may have to undergo biopsies. And, you know, the problem with some patients who find something on the memo and then after that cannot move on, they cannot get on with the treatments. There's a lot of these decision delays for biopsy and all that because they were not prepared. They were not prepared to know that when they go for a mammogram, if you find something, what's going to happen after that? I think a woman needs to know that before they decide to do a mammogram. Then it will be easier for everybody and also the patient after they found something, okay? So if you look at this, in a thousand women, 100 women will return for additional mammogram and ultrasound. 20 out of the 1,000, okay, is likely not to be cancer and has to return six months later to, to review another imaging, okay? Five out of 1,000 will be diagnosed with breast cancer. So I think, uh, I think I have another slide for this, never mind. So uh, 1,000 women, maybe only five people may be diagnosed, right? In Malaysia, it is about two, okay? Um, 61 out of 1,000 will have additional imaging and find nothing is wrong, okay? 
So there's a lot of harms to screening. So whenever a woman goes for mammogram, she finds something, it's almost like she's dying already, you know? Even though we know that's not true. But for the woman, that is a life-threatening event. You're telling me I might have cancer. That's life-threatening, okay? Right? 19 out of the 1,000 will have minimally invasive needle biopsy, okay? So they will have to go through steps if you find something on the mammogram. So I think as a GP, I think it's good to tell them this is what people do uh, after a mammogram is, and they have to, you know, inform consent that they know, oh, this is why I'm doing a mammogram. This is what happened. So they can mentally prepare themselves if they find an abnormal finding. All right. So what are the limitations? So detection of cancer is a limitation. So dense press has low sensitivity. Some cancer type, okay, uh, lobular cancer. This is the very notorious cancer that does not form a lump. So I have a woman, uh, when I did a session with breast cancer survivors, some, I think last year, she was saying, you know, I didn't find anything wrong with me. I went for my mammogram every year because I was so worried I did it every year. But I found that somehow as I got older, my breast became younger. So the breast became perky. It was much more firm than what it used to be. So this is a sign of lobular cancer. So she actually had lobular cancer despite all her years of screening. She was detected at stage 3 because the cancer was not seen on the mammogram and uh, it didn't form a lump. So she wasn't, she wasn't sure that there was a, a sign of cancer. Okay, So be careful of lobular. If a woman comes to you and says, oh, there's something wrong with my breast. It's changed in shape. It feels firmer refer her to a breast clinic and then the breast clinic will determine if we need to do further imaging or even sometimes we do uh, random biopsies in this type of patients, okay? Because it can be easy to miss. Lobular cancers are the cells that uh, form Indian, Indian files. That means, you know, it's like a, a row of cells rather than forming a tumor. So the lump is not felt. It's just like diffusely... Uh, invading into the breast tissues, okay? There is a lot of talk about overdiagnosis uh, for screening because in a lot of the Western countries now, since survival rates are so good, they want to improve quality of life of women. They find that a lot of unnecessary biopsies and all this overdiagnosis of cancers have happened. This can happen because some of the tumors are slow growing. It may not affect the life of that woman when you detect it on the mammogram. However, we are not able to differentiate who is going to get the slow growing and the, and the fast growing tumor. So I think at the moment, we in the Malaysian CPG, we still advise people go for opportunistic mammogram for early detection. Okay. All right. Okay. Benefits, early detection. Okay. So this is what we found in our hospital. So our opportunistic screening group, five in a thousand were detected with cancer. And then when we targeted high-risk women, that means they had family history and all that, it's about 125 in a 1,000. So if you were to practice in your hospital setting, uh, in your clinic setting, you it is okay actually to do opportunistic screening okay, in our country. And you can see that early stage cancer was very high when we do screening. All right, so I put this up. Uh, we have about, let's see, we have until 1240, okay. I put this up because I think there's a lot of things going on in the Malaysia healthcare system where we are, we are moving with the times and we're moving with market forces, right? So think before you do anything. So first one, tumor market. So I think the question just now was CA 153, all right? So this is all the tumor markers you can think of. You can see that for breast cancer, it's not just CA-153, it's CA-125, CAA, and all this, right? Okay, this is the big elephant in the room. Uh, the tumor marker has been slashed. This is not evidence-based, right? Because there are a lot of harms to this. All right, so let me see if I put it here. No, I didn't. Okay, so what are the issues with tumor markers? Number one, not sensitive. People with early breast cancer usually do not have a raised CA-153. I think we have published this like, I think more than 15 years ago, does not actually detect early cancers. Even stage three and four cancers, the, the, the markers are still normal, right? Okay, so that's falsely negative. So that's bad. 
because some patients, when even though after a biopsy is cancer, they insist they don't have cancer because their tumor marker is normal, right? So I think unfortunately this is like a cultural thing. I presented uh, about screening. I think this was five years ago uh, to a group of family medicine specialists a conference, and I think the discussion was they are so worried not to doing the tumor marker because in case they miss anything patient comes with worry, they want to do something to make the patient less worried, so they do the tumor markers, and if they don't do it, the patient may not like it. Okay, but is this evidence-based practice? It's not, okay? Alright, so false negative is bad enough. Okay, false positive is worse. So we have, I think every year in our breast clinic, we will have one patient that will come with an abnormal tumor marker test. Alright? And we've done the mammogram, ultrasound, MRI, okay? But these patients, they cannot sleep for two years, I think, minimum, because they do not know whether they have cancer. So that is why I would strongly suggest all GPs to stop doing tumor markers. We have to practice what is evidence-based. We have a CPG that is already tailored to our country. Please follow it. Just use what is evidence-based, okay? Because we are causing a lot of harms to the population, okay? Even patients who are high risk. I've, I've had very disappointed patients coming to the clinic when they have a BRCA gene or something like that. Then they come to the clinic and then they bring this whole pile, a file of um, cancer screening test results, right? So she will just pass it to me and say, look, I'm so happy. Everything is normal, you know? And then I have to get a bit the bearer of bad news that this doesn't mean anything, you know? So please, please, please do not do tumor markers. It does not help for breast cancer, okay? Other cancers, it may be useful, okay? For example, maybe for the hepatitis screening, okay? We have to, maybe you refer to Prof. Rosmawati's like the other day. But for breast cancer, no role at all. Full stop, slash, okay? Right. So think before you pink again about ultrasound. So I think this is the question by one of the listeners just now. Should we be doing ultrasound instead of the mammograms, right? <clears throat> so remember, uh, risk of the radiation exposure is not so bad unless they have a genetic predisposition that makes them very fragile to radiation, okay? So if we look at this uh, ultrasound uh, screening, uh, of course, there are some uh, publications now showing this to be an important part of cancer control in low-income countries because... Um, ultrasound is something that any doctor can do, right? Okay, I know GPs are very used to doing ultrasound. Even I am as a surgeon, I also do ultrasound in clinic, but I don't actually report any of it at all because uh, it is, I think, in the domain of the specialist radiologist who should be reporting the ultrasound and the mammogram so that we get high quality reports, okay? So at the moment, we know ultrasound is prone to operator error or operator dependent, right? It's, it depends on who's doing it. Ultrasound does not show microcalcification, right? So microcalcification is actually found only on mammograms. Some read, uh, ultrasound can see, but not that obvious, not easy to detect, right? So it is not perfect having the mammogram or the ultrasound alone. But if you do screening mammogram, and you do adjunct ultrasound, I think that's acceptable, right? Okay, so I think it's important that we know that ultrasound is not evidence-based, especially in a country where we have access to mammogram. All right, and, don't, and be careful when we do a lot of ultrasound because a lot of women cannot actually get insurance coverage because... Uh, they come, you know, okay, I want breast, breast screening and then I, unfortunately there are a lot of uh, health wellness centers uh, providing ultrasound screening as a screening tool. In women who are in their 20s, okay, what happens to these women is that they detect an abnormality on the ultrasound. It's very common. It's a very sensitive tool. You can detect all the benign lesions, right? But guess what? These poor women are not able to be insured for breast cancer. So I think it is a disservice to our community when we just do uh, ultrasound indiscriminately. We use it for 
diagnostic purposes. If the patient has symptoms, you use it to diagnose something. But don't do it for women who have no symptoms at all, who are just coming in for a checkup. Uh, so it would be a disservice to them because you know, even they come to a breast clinic, they get a report from the breast surgeon and the radiologist report is there say, stating that this is a benign lesion because it's a pre-existing condition. The, the insurance usually do not uh, cover for breast diseases. I've seen this so many times. It's very sad, okay? And these are women in their 20s. When they're, in the, when they're 50 years old, you don't know. You know, they may actually have a higher risk of cancer and they're not covered, okay? Right, so I've put up some reports because I think at the moment, we ultrasound is so readily available. And I think it's great. I think for clinicians, we need to have tools to help us make diagnosis, right? But it is only that, I think, um, that we should stop at that. We shouldn't really go ahead and say this is a screening tool, okay? Because whenever we get a report, I run both public and private clinics for breast cancer, and uh, not for breast cancer, for breast diseases, right? So patients who come with a, with a report, usually we depend on that report for our treatments, okay? Unfortunately, patients pay for this test. So when they come to see us, they have to pay again for another test, you know? So some of the reports are usually done by technicians, which is not bad. If you have a radiologist actually uh, covering or ensuring the report's quality is good. And remember, the bi is an important part of the report because the, the, the clinicians way of making decisions is based on the bi rats, right? So whenever we have patients like this, we have to repeat all the investigations, unfortunately. So patients have to pay so many times. So I would say for GPs who have ultrasound in your office, don't despair. You can still use it, but use it without reports. And I think you shouldn't charge so much because what happens is that, you know, they come to even our private clinic, the ultrasound is only 80 ringgit, you know? So they have to pay again for another test and it delays a lot also, okay? We can have this discussion later, right? Okay, so how do we make a diagnosis? Triple assessment. So, okay, remember when we talked about risk just now, we don't have a model, but we can assess risk based on the risk factors, right? Okay, so whenever we're talking about diagnostic tests, okay, screening uh, in Malaysia, we say 50 to 74, right? 40 to 50, you can consider. But this is diagnostic. Diagnostic means you want to diagnose someone with a symptom, maybe it's breast pain, maybe it's a breast lump, right? If it's a, for diagnostic purposes, a mammogram can be done 35 years and above, right? An ultrasound usually will be done for diagnostic purposes, regardless of age, okay? And of course, the biopsy. I think I mentioned to you already just now that we prefer core biopsy compared to FNAC, right? Okay, just to share with you, what happens after detection from the mammogram? The patient has to undergo what we call stereotactic biopsy because you cannot feel the lump, you cannot see it on ultrasound. You need the mammogram to find the lesion. So there are many systems available. You can explain to your patient what type of biopsy can be done. Usually, most centers have the sitting Type, the species seated, they will have the mammogram, local anesthetic will be uh, put into the tissues, right? But the breast will be compressed during the biopsy, okay? So, I mean, most patients tolerate it well, okay? Some may have bad experiences, but most people are okay. There is discomfort definitely, but there's a lot of local anesthetic being used and of course, painkillers can be used too. Some systems allow the patient to lie on their tummy. That means it's a supine system. I'm not sure which centers have this, but this is probably quite comfortable for the patient because sitting up, being compressed is not easy. Lying down, being compressed, maybe not too bad. Lah. Okay, right. Okay, and the other thing about stereotactic biopsy, the type of core needle can be either the usual core needle, which is, um, I think, 16 to 18 gauge, but you also have larger core needles, like the 12 gauge ones, which are bigger volume uh, biopsy. So in PPUM, UMSC, we actually do this. And we found that because we have better tissues, we have lesser operations. Because 
what happens when you do a core biopsy? If it's suspicious, if you're not sure, there's discordance, we would do an operation called hook wire localization biopsy. But if you have a larger needle, you can actually have um, better tissue uh, being removed. And hence, we cut down the, the number of operations that we need to do because of this needle. Unfortunately, the system is expensive. The, the vacuum system, we call it vacuum-assisted biopsy. Those systems, the, the, about the reusable stuff is about 3,000 ringgit. You know, it's so expensive. But uh, we find that it's probably better for the patients because they don't need to go for surgery. All right, then you have ultrasound guided. Ultrasound guided is always much better than stereotactic, more comfortable for the patient and also for the radiologist. Okay, so hook wire localization, as I mentioned, what we do is we, because we cannot feel the lesion, we need to localize it with the wire. And when we operate, we remove the, the lump with the margin. Okay, all right, so for screen detected, uh, if you can't really see, but there's a micro cal, we do the operation and then we will obviously uh, radiograph the hook wire specimen to ensure the margins as well as the, the presence of the lesion when we remove it. Okay. All right. So back to the CPG, I think for GPs, you might want to know that um, for the latest one, we have put a proposed clinical audit indicator for quality care where women who are in this category, more than 35 with science symptoms or high risk group with science symptoms and patients with clinical science of emergency should be referred within two weeks and the target is 80%, right? For this one, uh, the other KPI is mainly for the breast surgeons looking at the margins, clear margins when we do lumpectomies. That means it's a measure of good patient selection. Okay. All right. So in conclusion, we put up some guidelines. Maybe we can discuss further. But okay. So I think we are going to the next, I think the next 10 minutes will be mainly on the um, communication aspects. Okay. So every time a patient, as I mentioned just now, when we look at the model, even detecting the lump itself, the patient is already thinking she's got cancer. Okay. So the fear has set in, right? So see at every point, notice bodily symptom, that time they already worried they might delay, right? And then after that, they inform someone or they think it's nothing, they don't know much about it, they don't think it's anything, that time it's appraisal delay lah, they tak tahu, so tak tahu means you won't get through lah, okay. Then seek support, they have, uh, they forgot, they didn't disclose to anyone, they kept it to themselves, that will cause a delay. Then they visit the primary healthcare facility, GPs, or even sometimes could be the bidan, you know. We have a lot of pregnant women who have been, uh, unfortunately, misdiagnosed or delayed the diagnosis because was not recognized by the primary healthcare provider to be a suspicious symptom of cancer, okay? So any lump in a pregnant woman, please refer. They need to be diagnosed. It can, it, it, whatever it is, they need the proper workout. We've had a lot of delay in diagnosis for pregnant women because of this and also women who are breastfeeding, okay? Please refer if you find any of these type of patients uh, so that we make sure that we don't diagnose the cancers at a later stage for these gestational breast cancer patients, right? Okay, so of course, there are other things as well. You will see that fear sets in at many points in time, um, even at the beginning. Okay, so whenever a woman is threatened or a man, even a man, okay, men also can get breast cancer. And when men get breast cancer, it's also sometimes worse because not only it is the fear of the cancer, it is the stigma of having a woman's disease, right? Okay, so fear and all this and uh, they, they think they have a life-threatening illness even though they're so healthy at that point, they will go into grief, right? And I'm sure I don't have to tell you about this, the Kubler-Ross uh, stages of, of uh, grief. Every woman uh, or man would face these stages even at the point of finding a breast lump, okay? So I think as doctors, GPs in the primary care setting, it's important that you recognize that even that woman to bring up that she's got a breast lump may take her a long time. You know, she may be talking about something else and then at the end of it, by the way, doctor, that's when your time is almost up, right? Especially if you work in clinic kesihatan, right? You actually time maybe 10 minutes per patient or something. At the eighth minute, she will say, oh, actually, yeah, I have a breast lump, right? So, they, you need to understand these people are fearful and they are grieving 
because they think they got cancer, they got a lot of things to lose, right? So they go through all this denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and finally acceptance, okay? So our job as healthcare professionals is to help them be aware, self-aware that they are going through a bad time. It's a roller coaster ride, okay? And we need to also tell them there's this thing living and you will go through different stages. So when they have awareness, hopefully it will speed up the process, okay? But unfortunately, they have to still go through the process. Um, there's no magic bullet to help them through this. Some people accept earlier, then they can move on. Some people take a long time to accept, okay? So our job is try to help them accept what they have, right? Okay, and then uh, you will notice people need to cope, right? And there's this thing about the satisfaction and the energy levels, right? So sometimes when you see your patient, when they, for us, we, we diagnose them, we tell them about the diagnosis. But I think for GPs, it's more like even when you examine a patient and you find someone with locally advanced breast cancer, you can make a clinical diagnosis already at that point, isn't it? So that shock event is like, a period of, you know, they are so unhappy, you know, and their energy levels will be very low, you know, they refuse to understand, they may be actually, you know, resisting everything, right? And then they start having the catharsis, you know, they feeling despair, sadness, lethargy, right? Their energy levels will be very low at this point, right? And then slowly, 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 they will become resigned to the fact, or maybe we can say it's accepted, or in Muslim terms, it's red door. Lah. They red door that this is something happening to them, you know. And But at this point, it is still low energy because they haven't integrated the acceptance and the realization that there could be some benefit in detecting this at this point. Okay, so I think at this point, where we must help our patient reintegrate is that we must be able to communicate well and we must give them enough strategy and to frame everything in a positive light, okay? So that's, I think, a role that we play when we see our patients all the time. Okay, I'm not going to go through all this too much, but maybe just to say that coping is actually complex, right? Uh, there's a cognitive aspect. That means uh, they, they, they know how to think about the diagnosis, they understand and all that. And the behavior, what one does about it. Okay. But coping can actually be active or avoided. That means they can actively cope. That means they quickly set out a strategy. They can accept it, right? Or they completely go into avoidance. That means the denial and all this, right? So it really depends on their ethnic background, traditions okay of that person so i think for all of us you know we live in a very multicultural society we need to try to uh, learn about each other that means for me i must realize that as my boss lah professor yip you know she she's no longer my boss lah but she's still my guru lah right in those days where she said orang cina mesti takut mati right so i have to understand that and then for, 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 for non-Muslim uh, practitioners, you may have to understand that actually Muslim patients, they can actually use their religion to their benefit. They can use it to help them cope and help them seek the treatments if done correctly. Okay? So a lot of the negative forms of coping that we see sometimes like emotional repression, disengagement, okay? And usually all this will affect poor outcomes okay will affect to poor outcomes right so we have to help them express their emotional vulnerability so and then we need to help them have a strategy to maintain whatever they have with them and and you know learning to reach out to non-family for support and breast cancer is actually an important skill to have for these patients right Okay, I'm not going to go into details because I think I've got only about 10 minutes left. So sometimes, you know, how to help patients express their emotions. Actually, crying is a very good way to express your emotion. So when the patient cries, don't panic, okay? Just give them tissues. Let them cry because sometimes it's just an expression of their emotional vulnerability. They, they need to do this to get on with the different stages, right? Journaling may be helpful for some people, counseling, all right, art, okay, different people will cope and express the emotion in different ways, right? We must 
uh, give them strategies to self care that means take care of their health when they're going through this roller coaster use their religiosity and this is not only for the muslim patient we see in the christian patient the hindu patients right positive thing about religion is that there is a higher control a higher being they can pray to you know but when they start thinking everything as a negative uh, like fatalism they believe that you know this destiny they're going to die from this uh, you know and then they cannot change fate uh, these are negative religion coping so bring awareness of this to your patients and they will i think learn how to cope with it better all right we also found in our, our uh, one of our nursing lecturers she did a study and found that actually people use a lot of prayer for health so i think even though we are supposed to be agnostic in a way when we tell our patients right we need to understand the cultures in fact like hindu patients for example i usually talk to them about this you know because they can use this it's no point not giving them coping skills when they are stressed out right you can help them by making them self aware what sort of coping skills they can use so don't forget prayer for help for our religious patients right uh, okay then social support right so don't forget there's a lot of survivor groups and so forth out there right okay i'm not going to go into too much detail okay so shared decision making is something that we like uh, to do because we shared decision making is that you respect your patient as an expert in his life you have the expertise on what to do next as a medical practitioner but you need to use both of these experts to come up with a plan so that this person will be able to go through the treatments right so of course there are many many things about decision making which i'm not going to go through but i will go quickly into what we call the strategy of breaking the bad news remember bad news can be like a breast lump or locally advanced breast cancer not just after we've diagnosed it you know with the biopsy right so what is spike spike actually was um, published like i think this was in the 90s you know this is something um, uh, studied on how people have good experiences when they are given bad news right so the set the spikes mean setting perception invitation knowledge empathetic response and summary or strategy all right so let's just go quickly set up make sure when you are dealing with this you are not busy right you have set up a private area the significant others are there right okay and then perception this is very important i've always heard people complaining how brutal that doctor was when he told me the diagnosis i mean this is a very common team you know a lot among patients because we forgot to ask them first we can ask them you know what do you understand or remember last week or you know what do you think is happening to you now you've got a breast and now there's an ulcer there what do you think is wrong with you they will tell you i think it's cancer then only you say yes i think it's cancer so do not just tell them straight away ask them what they think about the thing first perception right invitation <clears throat> this is the other thing the brutal side is that oh you know there this is your biopsy report this is the results or you when you say locally advanced you got an ulcer this cancer okay that is not very sensitive so you need to invite because they they want to brace themselves for all this information right just ask would you like to know about what's happening ask them first they say yes 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 okay i'm ready don't don't wait for my husband i want to know everything myself then you will then give the knowledge the knowledge has to be given in a non technical uh, wordings and it has to be gentle and small bites don't give so many things at the beginning right right and the fifth one is emotions and the last one is strategy okay emotions is actually how do you what is empathy right a lot of doctors are very sympathetic we actually care for our patients or else we won't be doctors right but this skill of showing empathy is important for you to make sure your patient knows that you understand so we must practice what we call accurate empathy accurate empathy is expressing the emotions felt by the patient and normalizing the emotions of patient so for example you see a patient anxious right you you all had you all you have to do is validate oh you know i think you 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 look very anxious so that actually is showing that you understand what that person is going through you know so this is what we mean by accurate empathy it's not enough for you to in your heart you say kasiannya orang ni kasiannya orang ni but you are not expressing it okay but you cannot say lah kasiannya you 
You cannot say that poor you. See, sympathy is poor you. Empathy is that I can understand how it feels. Okay, you are you must be feeling anxious, right? So this is how you show empathy. All right, time is almost up, but um, there are many ways of doing this. So let that means you should have um no judgments as a healthcare provider. You should not judge your patients. So always pro. Do not say, oh, you know, you should have come earlier. Now is already an ulcer. Why are you coming now? This is a no-no, okay? You have to capture this patient at whatever point in time the patient has presented to you and support them. Because remember, survival rates, even for breast cancer who are locally advanced, is beyond 50% in five years. It's not 0%. Even stage four is not 0% in five years. It's about 21%, right? Okay, so other things like, Listening, very important. Listen, listen, listen. Do not just give unasked advice. Okay? Be sensitive to all kinds of non-verbal cues. If your patient is crying and you're just banging all the information, that's not a good idea. Just give her some time, right? All right. So the last one is strategy. I think the strategy is something that we all mustn't forget to do because the patient needs to, do, to know what to do next. What are the next steps? Because she is feeling like she cannot control her situation anymore. Everything out of control. Losing her bearings, right? You need to talk about what to do next. What is the strategy, right? And within doing this, you have to put in some positive reframing. That means, you know, every dark cloud has a silver lining. But where? what is the silver lining? So, for example... Someone who comes to you with severe pain because she's got metastatic breast cancer. She has an ulcerating mass in her breast. You know, what sort of strategy can we give her? It's almost like, I think for most GPs, you may find, oh no, this is like very hopeless. I'm, uh, this patient has no hope of living. You know, this is how we feel, right? But actually it's not true. Remember, breast cancer, uh, survival rate, even stage four is still there, Right? And remember, our treatment is not all about surviving the cancer. It's about quality of life, improving the pain. So for this patient, the strategy is to sort out her pain first. And that will give her something to hold on to. Even though this is a bad news, this is metastatic breast cancer, but she wants to sort out her pain first. So find positive things when you are doing the strategy with the patient. So for example, for me, when I have a patient, all of them feel like they're going to die tomorrow, uh, even though it is a mammographically detected cancer, most likely stage one or two. They have put themselves in a very negative uh, picture. So I will have to talk to them about surviving, how good the survival rates are for stage one and two, right? So you have to positive frame. A lot of people say, oh, you're giving people false hope. I think this is not really true. Whatever we say, uh, it's not false because it's true. Stage two and stage one, the survival rate is very good. So we have to find a, a, a method of uh, transmitting this information in a positive manner. And we're not giving false hope, by the way. Yeah. Okay. So I'm. That was my last slide, and this is actually my last slide. So um, just to share with you, we're having a webinar for clinicians on Draca genetic testing and risk management. I think a lot of people um, need to know more knowledge about genetic testing, risk management, but they also need to know how to help their patients make decisions. So we have two PhD students who are almost complete with their PhDs who have developed the patient decision aids. So we will be talking about it and we're actually launching the decision aids uh, on the 18th of October, which is next week. So this is my last slide. So I think Murali, um, sorry, I'm gone a bit over time, five minutes. So uh, that's my last slide. Thank you. Okay, lovely. Thank you so much, okay. uh, Prof, for the very enlightening and I think quite uh, detailed discussions. Always mm -hmm. helpful for everyone. We've got, we've got a few more questions, Prof. Um, I, uh, are you able to take them? Yep, I think I'm okay. Okay, so we've got about four questions so far. Two are combined questions. I'm just going to combine these questions, okay. uh, which is there are th these doctors ask about uh, the use of MRI for uh, screening uh, in terms of, so one doctor asks about MRI for screening for high risk mm -hmm. and uh, the other doctor is asking, why don't we use MRI for yearly screening since it doesn't have any radiation? 
Okay, I think for high risk screening, um, so I think number one, you need to stratify risk first, right? Only in high risk women, you should be doing MRI. The second one is you must know your MRI quality. It's very important because that's why even for me, I'm happy because my radiologists are so supportive of us and they, they are good at it because they're doing this so many times already, right? But it's important that when you choose to do MRI screening for your patient, the center that you are referring to has a breast radiologist. This is very important, okay? Because you might find your reports are not going to be very helpful, right? Because they are going to find many things on MRI. MRI is an extremely sensitive tool. Uh, the patient uh, upper need for biopsy actually increases when we do MRIs, okay? But it is justified in a high-risk population, right? Okay, so the question about um, why don't we do MRI for high-risk women only, right? So remember when we talked about mammogram, the detection is for microcalcification. So sometimes even microcalcification you cannot see on MRI, okay? So this is why these tests are all not 100% accurate on its own. So it helps each other, you know? So if you do a mammogram, you're not sure you do an MRI. Or, um, but when it comes to screening, we should be doing mammogram also and MRI also. Because the evidence actually is a combination of these two that actually downstage the cancer, the high-risk patient, the cancer of the high-risk patient, right? Okay. So I hope that okay. answers the question. Yep. Okay. There's another question on what is the role of contrast-enhanced digital mammography? CD, ah. CD. Okay. Screening so, sensitive is it compared to other modalities yeah i think this is a very good tool uh i think a lot of the radiologists you know it's just the money like you don't cannot afford the software the whatever apple wheels the bells and whistles that you need to have to actually do this uh, it helps uh in treatment planning um look at the distribution of the cancer for this is more for treatment purposes but for screening, there is some evidence to in the high risk population that it may be helpful in screening. It's not widely available. I think in some, uh, I think HKL has it. Uh, I'm not sure any other places have it. But uh, yes, I think if the radiologists had an option, they would want this to help them with the um, more for the treatments. For screening only in the high risk population, there is some evidence. Okay. Right, and uh, there's another question, probably this is a little bit of a different question, uh, on uh, how safe is breast firmer lotions or gels, which are in the market, those with KKM approval? What is it? Breast firming gels, is it? Uh, breast firming lotions or gels. Okay, la. this one, as usual, the evidence need to be there, right, for us to comment on whether it's safe or not. Um, the problem with uh, KKM approval, if it's uh, is something like a food additive or something traditional and there's no, they don't say it's something for health, they cannot really control it, right? I mean, if you right. think about it that way. Um, whether it's safe or not, I guess it depends on what it is. If it has some hormonal content, uh, even though it's a, a applied on the skin, there could be subdermal sort of absorption right so the short question short answer to this question is that nobody knows right but i guess if you have anything containing hormones you would be a bit wary about um recommending it to your patients um and then just another thing about these issues i think among the gps i don't know whether anyone practices filler injections and all this I think this is the other issue that we are seeing a lot now in breast clinic and maybe it's not the aesthetic physicians uh, having problems. They do have problems, right? I mean, the complications from this injection, but it's the beauticians doing it, you know? They inject all these fillers and then the patient come with infections and then sometimes we have no options but to do mastectomy sometimes, you know, because it's just the whole breast is infected and all that. So please uh, advise your patients when it comes to aesthetics and all this, please go to the certified people, lah, plastic surgeon, people who are, you know, uh, credentialed okay. and, yeah, credentialed and accredited to do these procedures. Don't go to some, you know, uh, apa, kedai kedai dekat rumah lah, you know, all kinds of things happening now. Yep. Right. Okay. 
Okay, I think I think that's really a very timely reminder, uh, Prof. There's also another question from Dr. Hari uh, on uh, how far are we from uh, establishing one-stop breast clinics in all public hospitals? Um, some okay. thoughts on this, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, I wish we 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 could do that. I think um, it's possible if we prioritize the service. So, like in our hospital, PPUM. I mean, we're no longer very cheap. Lah. We're quite expensive also. Our diagnostics and all the biopsy and everything might cost the patient 600 ringgit, you know, but it's still cheaper than private. Lah, okay? But the one-stop center uh, is still a dream for us. We have tried to reorganize our services so that we can get our imaging on the same day. But because we just have too many patients, the issue is, is there enough public hospitals who can do image guided biopsies? So that's that's a very important uh, thing that we have to solve first. Because if all patients go to certain public hospitals, it's not going to solve the issue because we have too many patients, and then our service will get uh, beaten up lah because we cannot give timely diagnosis and all that, right? But um, at the moment, uh, most of the university hospitals they probably have expedited pathways to diagnosis, and and I showed you. Hospital Tuanku Apuan Rahima, they also have an expedited uh, process where they have this pink ribbon center where they have medical officers uh, like um, um, dedicated medical officers who will take care of these patients. Once they get into the system, anybody with a breast lump goes into this pink ribbon center and then they organize everything within a week. You can see their numbers. It's actually quite good. They, they can achieve that in about 95% and above of their patients. So they are trying to do in six hospitals. So I'm not sure how that is getting on. So we probably have to get people from uh, Datuk Yusof's side to comment on that. Um, but I do hope that that will realize. Because um, I think they have it in quite a few places. Sarawak, Laka, uh, Kelantan, I think. I'm not sure. But there are six public hospitals currently in that program. So we do hope this is going to be achieved and it will be very, very useful. Um, because I guess you see the problem with any screening program, you need the ability to do the image guided biopsy. So if you don't have enough of these centers, you find a big backlog and our quality will never improve. So as you can see from um, the comment earlier about, you know, like... Uh, the biopsy, you know, the sclerotactic and all that. So, for example, if you live in a rural town, right, uh, your access to mammogram is maybe what, um, maybe three hours away or two hours away or one hour away. What about the biopsy, you know? Once you do a mammogram, then what happens after that? So, I think the strengthening of health systems is our main priority now to be able to sort out this late stage presentation, we got to strengthen the health system diagnostics first. We have to map out where are the places you can have access for the poor patients. I think private sector, no problem. You know, there's so many, okay? But even that is only located in the big cities. And it's not impossible in the private sector to go there, see a breast surgeon, get your biopsy, ultrasound, everything on the same day, and then your biopsy in two days' time your surgery the next day. It's possible, you know, yeah. this is possible. But public sector, we haven't gotten to the extent of mapping our services, making sure access to patients around the country is there. You know, so macam uh, East Coast pun, you know, like radiotherapy machine pun, you know, macam tak ada. So can you imagine what more diagnostics, you know? I, I think right. we've forgotten about the diagnostics part. We've been talking about treatments all the time oncologists all the time, we forgot about surgeons who are the diagnosticians in the public service, the radiologists with the intervention radiology, the best breast, uh, breast radiology um, biopsy skills. Those have not been addressed yet, I think. To be able to sort this question, you need to help strengthen the health system. Right. So uh, one last question, and I'm just going to intervene uh, very quickly. There's a lot of confusion about the codes. So the first code was diagnosis, yeah? Spell it however you want. Diagnostics is also fine. Uh, and the second code, just let me give it to you, is uh, tomosynthesis. Uh, just to keep it with uh, perhaps what Prof was saying earlier. So the first code was diagnosis. 
Uh, the second quote is tomosynthesis. Uh, Prof, I've got one last question, uh, if we could be able to take that. Uh, are you okay still, Prof? I'm sorry, we're eating quite a bit into your time. No, no, it's so, okay. I'm, I'm fine. Okay, uh, so uh, last uh, question on uh, how do you handle a situation when the children or relatives uh, actually ask you not to tell the patient that, that uh, she has cancer? Okay, I think, you know, uh, we call this collusion, right? You don't tell the patient, but you tell someone else, right? I think the, the most, you see, we are all Western trained in a way. We believe in patient autonomy, right? That is our principle in care, right? Patient autonomy. However, we are living in a multicultural setting, uh, but there are already studies that show, even, I mean, this study was done in India, when there's collusion, the patient actually had poorer quality of life, you know? That means, the, the, because, you know, this is in, a, in an Asian setting where exactly what we have here, lah, you know, uh, family do not want the patient to know because they're trying to protect them, right? So, I think the short answer to that is that you must try and ask them the patient as much as you can. And you must ask the patient, do you prefer me to tell your family members? Because some patients prefer, you know, they prefer their family members to know and do everything for them. They just follow whatever they say. There are people like that. But for most things, I think the patient autonomy is an important thing. And the studies have already shown that the collusion actually makes the patient quality of life worse. So I think how you can handle it is to bring the attention and awareness to the family members because the family members may not understand that they are causing harm to their family member too you know so you can talk about even maybe even counseling the family members to see what is the main concern they have why don't they want to tell the family member right so i would say uh, not an easy task but uh, i think once the family members are aware that actually it may cause harm to the patient they may actually allow, you know, and agree that you should discuss. But you see, first of all, when you do this, you have to ensure the family member that you are going to do it in a good way, in a gentle way. Because I think, you see, um, we must always inject hope. In, in any situation, there is always hope that we must uh, communicate to the patient. So I think in order for the family member to allow you to tell their family member, you have to give them confidence that you are going to handle it in a very good way, professional, caring, gentle, right? So that the family, the, 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 the person with the cancer does not get a bad, um, what do you call this? A bad experience. Okay? Right, and I think that that's really uh, critical. So uh, with that really, um, I think as we... we uh, kind of wrap up this session. I, I hope it's been as beneficial uh, for you all as it, as it has been for me personally. Like I said, uh, Prof covered, I think, quite a bit of uh, mm -hmm. uh, details uh, ranging from, uh, I mean, uh, uh, how the situation is on the ground today, your data, uh, what we have now, what is the conditions. We looked a little bit at the screening guidelines and how that has changed. And uh, maybe this is a good time to kind of point out that feel free to download the the new uh, guidelines for management. It's on the uh, KKM West website as well as the Academies of Medicine website. So you can download it and, and have a look through uh, as well that may be uh, beneficial or helpful for us in, in, in how we manage our patients. Uh, and uh, just to share that Prof was on the panel that actually uh, sat on, on uh, putting those guidelines uh, together as well. So uh, quite a, a bit of uh, good info right from the horse's mouth. And also, I think we had quite a bit of session, uh, quite a bit of information on um, how to actually discuss and converse with the patients. So really, I hope it's been helpful for everyone. Um, as you all know, put up the codes, the CME links have been sent to you for you to put in your, uh, requ uh, your uh, requisition for CME points, and then we'll get that done. Thank you very much. Please have a uh, an interesting rest of the pink October month and, and hopefully you spread a little bit more about awareness pertaining to the disease uh, that continues to afflict us. Uh, uh, National Cancer Society would like to thank you for joining us this morning and of course thank you so much Prof and uh, ladies and gentlemen for those who are interested in other like non-related uh, breast uh, cancer activity we're also running the National Tobacco Control Conference that happens next week uh, and there's uh, actually, there's 20 points 
uh, on for that. It's also a virtual session run over four days. Please feel free to register uh, if you do that. So uh, have a nice weekend. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Prof, again. Okay. And, uh, we'll Pleasure to be here.